Hello and welcome to my review of Project Zero for the PlayStation 2. Developed in 2001, Project Zero, known as Fatal Frame in America and simple as Zero in Japan, is a horror game by Tecmo, now known as Koei Tecmo, and was one of the early titles for the PlayStation 2. The team went to great lengths to promote the game in the US, stating on the box that it was based on a true story, though that was more of an urban legend if true at all. You start out playing as a young man named Mafuyu, who is on a mission to investigate a remote and allegedly haunted mansion on the outskirts of Tokyo, where he is looking for a novelist and his crew who went missing recently. It is not long though before he goes missing as well, and the torch is then passed to his younger sister, Miku, whom you play as for the rest of the game. Throughout her investigation of the Himuro mansion, she learns of a grotesque ritual known as the Strangling Ritual that took place in the mansion several decades ago for the purpose of keeping a certain hell gate shut, but that this ritual went horribly wrong, causing the headmaster to go on a rampage and slaughtering the entire family. The hell gate is still open, with the spirits of the underworld leading through, and it is thus up to Miku to find a way to seal it, hopefully find her brother in the process, and get the hell out of there. It is not long though before she is confronted with the source of the curse, a malevolent spirit known as Kirie, who casts the rope curse on Miku herself, slowly making rope marks appear all over her body, and effectively putting her on a time limit to solve the case. Note that there is an internal clock in the game, but personally, I have never gotten a game over from a time up, so I don't know if this time limit is for story purposes only, or an actual gameplay element. At the same time, she also learns that a certain mythical holy mirror is the only way to break the curse. So over the game's five chapters, not including the prologue, it becomes her mission to locate all the pieces of it. This is the first game in the series, but it would eventually become a key staple of the Zero games that the story always revolves around a ritual gone wrong, for one reason or another and the main character dealing with the repercussions. You control Mafuyu and later Miku with the left analog stick, the X button being your confirm button that you also use to investigate the environment and take pictures when in viewfinder mode. The circle button puts you in viewfinder mode, the triangle button pulls up the menu or makes you do a quick turn if in viewfinder mode, and the square button makes you run. Oh right, your weapon is a camera in this game. Which may sound absurd to some, but I actually think it makes sense. When you think about the old belief that a photo is a way to capture one's soul, and it sure makes a hell lot more sense than bringing a gun. The game makes a good effort of showing you the ropes on how the camera works, as new features are discovered. But the gist of it is that you go into viewfinder mode when a ghost shows up, power then accumulates the longer you keep the ghost within the capture circle, with damage being dealt when you snap the shot. The damage is higher and nets you more bonus points if you take the photo at the last possible moment, known in this game as a zero shot. Later games would introduce a step above zero shot called a fatal frame shot, possibly being a nod to the game's American title. Pretty simple, right? Like I said, you gain points for fighting ghosts, which is the way you upgrade your camera's power to better take on the challenges of a head where you will of course meet stronger ghosts as you progress. Each variant of ghosts also come with their own patterns and behavior that can make some of them a real pain to fight. On the other hand, when you learn these patterns, it makes it easier to snap zero shots and thus earn more points with little effort. If you feel backed into a corner, them being ghosts, you can use that to your advantage, passing right through them, barring of course that you don't run straight into an attack and proceed to the opposite end of the corridor in order to put some distance between you. Sometimes though, you will encounter them in tight spaces, in which instances you just have to play smart and be quick on the trigger. You can, if you are lucky, shake a ghost off you before it gets to take a bite of you, but don't push your luck on that. You will also discover ammunition in the form of film cartridges, starting at type 14 film, with stronger variants becoming available to you later. In this game, your weakest film type has a limit, whereas the later games would introduce a weaker type 7 film 
With infinite ammo, keeping the challenge fair while making sure you don't end up in a dead game. It also makes it so that you don't have to waste ammo photographing close and non-hostile ghosts, which is neat. Alas, that is not the case here. But at every save point, which are in the form of cameras of course, you can restock up to 30 shots of such falls in film. Note that unlike the early Resident Evil games, there is no limit to how many times you can save your game. Other things you will find are medicinal herbs for healing small wounds, sacred water that refills your entire health meter, mirror stones that act as an automatic one-time revive if your health reaches zero, though you can only carry one at a time, and various documents like newspaper scraps, journals and audio tapes that all add to the story and helps you understand what has happened in the mansion along with the final thoughts of, of some of its victims. The game is also very explorative as you sometimes find these things out in the open as shimmers of light and other times have to hug objects like chests of drawers that sometimes contain these. Which brings me to the hidden ghosts. Throughout the game you will encounter hostile ghosts, the ones that attack and are your source of income for upgrading the camera, but you will also meet passive ghosts that serve to point you in the right direction should you get lost. And finally, there are hidden ghosts which are not necessary to story progression, but make for a fun easter egg hunt and also gives more backstory to the victims of the house. Your camera's viewfinder will glow orange when a hostile ghost is near or a passive ghost and a blue when a hidden ghost is near, giving you a subtle clue to their whereabouts. Maybe something good will happen if you find them all. You will also want to repeatedly retread old grounds, as new items and hidden ghosts may be located where they weren't before. Sometimes it also pays to go off the beaten path to search an area that you are not supposed to go yet, but may hold an herb or a journal. Every chapter will also eventually have you face off with an extra strong boss ghost. These stand out in that they have a unique design, are the ghost of someone you have read about and are now laying to rest. They hit harder and are harder to kill. Don't get too excited when the blue light flashes though, as it doesn't always indicate the presence of the hidden ghost. It may also tell you that a sealed door is nearby, or other objects emitting spiritual energy. You can't just wander off everywhere you want at all times. Sometimes you will come across doors that are boarded up, for now. Other times you will encounter doors that have a magic seal placed upon them. How this works is that you take a photo of the door, or other object in question, which will then reveal another location that you must go to, where you must either snap another photo of a certain object in order to break the seal, solve a simple puzzle, or find an item you need in order to solve the puzzle. You don't always come across sealed doors though. Sometimes they are just simply locked with a combination lock that always give you a clue as to where in your notes you can find the solution. Fun fact, in the PS2 version the numbers on these combination locks would appear as Japanese symbols and going counterclockwise. In the Xbox re-release though, the symbols are replaced by actual numbers and the direction is flipped. To be honest, while this indeed makes it easier and more convenient to solve the puzzle, it also takes away some of the game's charm in my opinion. Upon completing the game you are rewarded with a harder difficulty nightmare that just makes the ghosts hit harder as well as two extra costumes and a bunch of other extra features. Speaking of the Xbox version, I would go as far as to call it the definitive version as it adds an extra fatal difficulty, more special costumes when certain requirements are met, a new ending making a total of three as well as more hidden ghosts for you to hunt. This being a horror game, it of course won't come with any catchy or headbanging tracks that you'll hum and remember for weeks. What it will offer though is ambient sounds accompanying the absolutely bone chilling atmosphere this series would become known for. I am not easily scared myself, but this game even gets to me sometimes. It knows 
when to be subtle, it knows when to be intense, it knows when to play just the right audio effect to make you jump, and the ghosts moaning when you find them is absolutely horrifying. Which brings me to the voice acting. Of course, bringing this game to the west meant translating the entire game to English, including the voice acting. And while Mafuyu is completely dead inside, so this is Himuro Mansion. And most of the audio recordings you find sound artificial, for lack of a better word. I know this sounds crazy, but there's something here besides us in this mansion. The acting, in my opinion, does have a certain early 2000s horror charm to it. My brother was in search of someone. Junsei Takamine, a famous novelist, and a man my brother was very indebted to, disappeared while researching a book. Yes, it sounds a little forced at times, but it does set a spooky atmosphere. Miku herself is a mixed bag, sometimes being scared, while other times coming off as indifferent, but she generally reacts appropriately to the horrors she encounters. The graphics are early PS2, but does look good for the time and holds up really well. Everything looks dank, abandoned and sad, with the sometimes grainy and murky graphics only adding to the horror. As a nod to old Japanese horror movies and to set the tone, the prologue chapter with Mafuyu is set in black and white, shifting over to color once you take control of Miku. One might argue that detracts from the horror, but I honestly don't think so. You occasionally get flashbacks either about Miku's past, or the pasts of the ghosts she, in she gets in contact with. And to distinguish past and present, these are set in monochrome as well. The ghosts themselves are of course presented in black and white too, often with horrifyingly haunting expressions reflecting their final moments of unreal labor. If it wasn't obvious already, I hold this game in very high regard. Sure, it is not perfect, what game is? And it does have some shortcomings that later games in the series would fix or improve. But for a first game, I think Project Zero is a damn fine example of horror done right, without relying too much on cheap jump scares. It tells an engaging story and sprinkles a few puzzles out for you that keep you interested and keep you wondering what lurks behind the next corner. You will not only want to go back to see if you can put the ghosts in their place when they have more bite to them, but some hidden ghosts and journals are also only found within a certain chapter. So when you unlock the ghost list upon your first completion, you will want to go back and find those that you missed. Project Zero would move on to become a cult classic, with at present five main series games, one of which has never been released outside Japan, a remake of the second game on Wii, when Nintendo bought the rights to the franchise, one spin-off on the 3DS, and one exclusive to Japan for mobile phones. A manga series never released outside of Japan, and a Japanese live-action movie that we don't talk about. Most subsequent games would uphold the tradition of rewarding the player with exclusive power-ups, costumes, extra endings, and so on upon game completion or if enough hidden ghosts or other objects have been found, in order to make replaying more appealing. So, if you are at all into horror, like a good ghost story, or, dare I say, like Japanese culture, as these games are, as the saying goes, very Japanese, then this game, and the rest in the series for that matter, are definitely for you. Thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you later.